a faithful member of IMI. Uh, so he's probably the most prominent outside member, uh, outside mathematics, but he's mathematician by uh, birth. My father is mathematician. I do not have a PhD in mathematics. I have one in chemistry. <laughs> okay, so we will talk about music. Okay, um, good morning. And uh, it's a pleasure as a uh, non mathematician, but uh, still a member of this amorphous virtual institute uh, to uh, talk a little bit about it. Um, uh, happy birthday to both Pencho and uh, Wolfgang. Uh, Pencho and I, we share the same burden uh, of what it means to uh, run a center or an institute in the post-academic times. <laughs> so uh, there was a lot of uh, nodding and uh, eye rolling in meetings that uh, uh, we had together. And um, of course, Wolfgang, I know uh, since quite some time, and uh, in one of the early um, works that were done between the IMI and the Nano Center. From 2009, we had three workshops here. Um, and uh, that some of uh, the um, results of this workshop were then um, put into this book, Modeling Nanoscale Imaging in Electron Microscopy. And if you actually go through the names of uh, people who uh, are on the um, chapters in this book, you will see that we start out with Kantianism at the nanoscale, which is a good friend of mine from the philosophy department, because I also moonlight in the philosophy department. Uh, you can see that these here, Nigel Browning uh, and, 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 and collaborators, are um, internationally well-established uh, um, experimentalists, as is Angus Kirkland, who talked about exit wave resolution. And then you see Peter headed uh, two papers, one on compressed sensing and electron microscopy, and the other one on non-local means. And uh, there are a lot of people who are actually in the room here that uh, contributed to that. And uh, one of the highlights, I think I can say also for me as a non-mathematician in uh, this workshop were the presentations of uh, Singer and Skolinski, because I was always absolutely amazed how you can actually get information out of data that I I saw the data and I said how can you actually get information in cryoelectron microscopy with a single particle approach out there and um, so this was 2009 was the first workshop 10 and 11 it's since morphed into um, international collaboration and where Peter's done a lot of organizational we were in um, Banff, Canada, at a conference there. We had one in Oaxaca, in Mexico, at the Institute of Mathematica. And Peter's already working on uh, the one in Los Angeles for 21, correct? So we'll see. We'll see. So um, there's a lot of kudos that go to Peter in order to put it a bit flippantly. He does more than just bring the coffee. <laughs> Um, and later on, his, as history evolves, um, you know, in 2017, cryoelectron microscopy received the Nobel Prize. And um, that was in particular for the high resolution structure determination of biomolecules in solution. And this is a technique that has now completely taken over. I mean, when I was a younger man, it was X-ray, crystallography, a little bit of neutron, a little bit of NMR. But now, because we don't have to crystallize these crystals anymore, but we can take direct images of where these proteins are in, in, in membrane, this has basically become the most important technique. And it comes out of this mathematics of uh, single particle um, um, imaging that uh, is quite complex and starts out with, at least for me, high level topology. And um, so that's that's very, very rewarding to see. One, one first message is we have very new and powerful tools to 
study structure. We have X-rays traditionally, but we have them in synchrotrons. We now have three electron lasers. Three electron lasers are absolutely revolutionizing the way we look at structures. We have neutrons in particular installation sources and bottom microscopes. And in all cases, in all cases, mathematics is the enabling tool that allows us to get to the structure. So from a purely pragmatic point of view, I would always uh, advise my experimental colleagues to uh, find uh, uh, close collaborations with mathematicians because the things that we find amazing, like the single particle approach, is pretty much uh, Peter will look at me and say, oh, we've done that in 2000, that's, that's all straightforward now. It's like compressed sensing still excites experimentalists. And a lot of people are saying, well, that's all done now, right? So, um, there, there's a time lag there where an applied mathematician can do a lot of good in these kinds of fields. So if you want to see what happens, this is, this is actually from the uh, website of the Nobel Prize before um, the, the resolution. And I will explain why this resolution got so much better. This is the kind of resolution of a protein wall that you could get out of cryoelectron microscopy. You'd have to take the, the protein, you'd have to freeze it. Then once you've frozen it, basically contained in a huge chip of ice. You run an electron beam through it, and you detect images. And if you look at these images, they look like uh, basically changes of grayscale slightly. It looks like a cloudy day in London. You know, that's, 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 that's basically what it is. And now, particularly with aberration corrections, you can get down to resolutions like this, which allows a biologist absolutely immediately figure out if he has alpha helixes here, beta sheets, or whatever. Because the game in, in, in protein structures is a little bit easier because we always know what the sequence is. And once we know the sequence, we know what the connectivity is. We have the topology. You can basically fit envelopes, and that's what they do to these kind of densities. And so it's, it's, it's amazing, and it has an enormous impact. It's because if these babies fold wrong, you will get sick or Yes? Also, I mean, what are the new quality measures for construction of that? Because if I look at the detail, there there's, there's, there's no way of localizing how the actors you can find. So, why is the, the, the right one, which is when you zoom in, probably of the same nature as the left, why is that? Because what, what you're doing here is you're matching. You, you're matching because you already know the metrics and the topology. Once you have the DNA sequence of a protein, you know how they're connected, the various amino acids. We have ample. I see. So there is a. The, there's always a sequence known. And then the question is how does this beast, a sequence is like a string. And this string will now fold. And so it becomes a problem of matching how this folding then matches the electron density there. Because if we know if we have a certain well, amino this acid. This is just the probability distribution. Yeah, it's, a, it's an electron density distribution. And uh, we then basically have this string. And now how do we fold it? And it's pretty straightforward following the sequence. Once you've identified the sequence that you go with sulfur containing uh, amino acids like cysteine because they scatter more. And then you say, well, we don't have to discover anymore what the carbon-carbon bond or the carbon-sulfur bond is. We know that. We can put, it's, it's basically matching. In the old days, you, you did this in the, up, up to about 85, 86 with hot gloves, where you actually cut the, 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 the molecule in your hand and adapted it. Now this is all done by algorithms. They just run through it. They have other information, uh, so-called distance least square. Uh, data that come from NMR. So this is this is a routine standard process. And the reason cryoelectron microscopy is taking over and has taken over, it's not taking over, it has taken over, is because you don't have to grow crystals anymore. Because you're taking these molecules and putting them into ice. In the early days when you wanted hemoglobin or you wanted some other um, protein, you might have a student spend two, three years trying to grow a crystal. And then you have to pray that this crystal is stable 
uh, with x-rays and uh, you can actually get various data out and, and data that you have to use. Now this is the thing of NIH has a center for that. They take your solution and then you, you go on the data. And that's what biologists want. I mean, biologists say we're not structural scientists. We just need to know if there's any anomaly and if that anomaly, a cleft like this, can be somehow related to a disease of prion or whatever. That's 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 their game. So they're very pragmatic about this stuff. And so that's that's why. All of them, yes. This is, and, and the matching is basically a database. It's a dictionary of the various amino acids and how they can connect. You can do the problem of the permutations. You can do the probability. You can actually see if you look at how the exact structure of these uh, um, amino acids are, you get a distribution, a slight distribution, which represents in a certain way an energy uh, potential to this is all pretty straightforward. You don't even need to do parallel computing or anything like that. You can run this on the CPUs and it just works out. So, um, but the thing that of course drives this too, and that's something where mathematics comes back in again, is if you just look at this case, we deal with huge numbers, huge numbers of probabilities. And that's why people want to sequence fast and people want to look at structure fast. Why? You think of it, you have 20 different amino acids. That's known. The ones that are biologically active. 20 different amino acids. An average protein has about 300 residues. That means how many proteins are connected to each other. Which gets you to an astronomic number of uh, uh, total numbers that could exist there. It's just astronomically. Actually, I always tell the students, if you take these uh, um, 10 to the 390, there's a 3 missing there. Uh, the universe, no, elementary particles is 10 to the 90. So we can make more proteins than there are known elementary particles in the universe. So that's what, uh, that is exactly the point. That is exactly the point. So if you take the mass of one protein only, of all these 10 to the 390, you create more mass than is known to exist in the so what you have is an enormous amount of junk structure because the functionality of these proteins is a very, very sparse property that you have. And right now, people are just going through, you might have heard this term junk DNA. Uh, that's basically DNA where either we don't know what it's there for, or it's just basically junk that exists due to biological evolution where we move to a better algorithm and uh, this kind of stuff is still somewhere in our program, but uh, we're jumping between there. So there's an enormous amount of, of, of uh, uh, permutations, mathematics, structure mixing, and so on that can go down. But before I go into the details of what we're doing, um, and since everybody puts up their pictures now uh, from the 1970s, um, Wolfgang has been shown to be a practitioner, here he is with the uh, German Federal Eagle, proudly on uh, his chest. And Ron, uh, this maybe uh, you got a bit confused because the color of the athletic suit wear is a little bit different, but is this the 59 year old lady? That <laughs> the 59 year old lady is the one in the middle of the top. <laughs> this is the lady. This is the lady. The, the, the guy yeah, he's is sliding all up. Yeah, yeah, that's the lady. Yeah. Okay. Okay, and uh, you see that Wolfgang is not only a practitioner, but here he is uh, um, teaching. And so I personally hope that uh, in both these aspects, Wolfgang still has a few kick high kicks left in him. Okay. He's got new hips for that, and I also hope that he will yeah. continue to uh, enlighten people, not just in Taekwondo, but also in mathematics, because there's a lot of profit from it. And again, that's the so what am I what do I want to do since I'm a little bit of an odd ball out and I can't um, do high level mathematics I will show some simulations later on but I want to give you sort of the topics and conclusions um, the beginning the one thing is I will describe how we as material scientists solid-state chemists use microscopy today and I want to talk a little bit about the imaging culture and the challenges. And the discussion we've had before already indicates that there are clear cultural issues and uh, issues regarding the challenges um, 
in these fields because um, I think there is a very important role for iconoclastic counterculture to develop. And that's my view where mathematician comes in. Because we have uh, a little bit of a problem. And I, in my term, scientific icon is the central, explicitly stated organizing assumption in a given discipline. An assumption held in practice by the substantial majority of researchers. And if you look at research, that can actually be different from tribe to tribe. A condensed matter physicist, a biochemist, inorganic chemists, they all will have slightly different cultures and, have, and, and worship slightly different icons, scientific icons. So, so Tom, when you have an administrator here who said, I can see mathematicians walking down the street. <laughs> I'm just wondering, you know, they would walk with uh, jerks or what? No. It's <laughs> nerds. So what I, what I want to advocate is autonomous, reliable and efficient complement to this image culture. And I think mathematics and modern computing science actually for, uh, right now presents an enormous opportunity for that. So just to give you a sort of a feel where we start out, we start out with very, uh, the best data that we can get. And you don't have to know anything about the details, but anybody who looks at this sees that there are sort of these streaks coming down. That's an observation, an experimental observation. And as materials chemists and solid state chemists, we will then have a model which becomes part of our icon. And in this case, it's topological change. You're looking down this direction, corner share of the hydro. And to understand these streaks, and these streaks are related also to properties, what you're doing is you're in some areas not connecting along the corners anymore, but you're connecting along the edges. And that has radical implications for the properties. So here already you see one of the problems then. Because in the absolute perfect structure where you have just the corner sharing of the hydro, we say we have translational symmetry, we have unit cells. Now defects come in. So the problem is in every imaging technique, do we ignore defects or do we acknowledge them? And we have to look at both sides because if we just ignore them, it's the essential part of the property of this material that's related to the defects. And uh, we cannot just approach it purely by looking at nice, beautiful translational symmetry and unit stilts uh, being stacked on top of each other. Because what happens, and this will become more important later on, is if you just look at perfect crystals where there's no disorder, the world is simple. We have frag reflections. This is dimension, this would be one dimension, and it's only the intensities that is in these Bragg reflections that we care about, and we can calculate where the positions of the atoms are and many other crystallographic um, characteristics. As soon as you have imperfection, and this imperfection can become important for your properties, you're not just having um, Bragg peaks, these Bragg peaks broaden, and you will see in between, you get diffuse scattering. So now you can't just look at translational symmetry, you have to also look at what's between the Bragg reflections. And if you go even further, diffuse scattering in glass or proteins or things like that, you actually get this as a diffraction pattern and you can then do Fourier transforms of that and do various uh, approaches there too. This has actually, due to the advances of computing that we have, a lot of people are looking at crystals and in particular crystals with this order, pretty much like glasses now because they're afraid of missing the diffuse scattering and only focusing on the Bragg reflections, which will not allow them to figure out what certain properties, how they uh, relate to the, to, to the structure. But the models are always quite simple. This is one of my favorite pictures. People might have seen that already. It's pretty bad in the original. Uh, these are the four musketeers of uh, solid state chemistry. This is one of my former bosses, uh, Jean Galli from Toulouse. Um, and these are two Australians, Bruce Hyde and uh, Les Mercil. And this, prop, this, this, this mechanism that leads to this topological change in the structure that I've shown you was simulated in an analog model here with beer cans, ping pong balls, and uh, golf balls. And uh, this is Stan Andersen from uh, Sweden who's making sure that we have enough in the oxygen lattice here with these aluminum cans. 
so that we can then shear and mechanistically understand very, very simple model what happens in these structures during the topological change. Uh, you're actually shearing. What he's doing here with his hand is shearing, and then you're moving from a corner sharing into an edge sharing, and then you're watching what, how, what, what, what these cations do in there. It's a perfect analog model that you can do. And this was a very important sort of meeting. And uh, these guys were very creative, and they were also pretty good drinkers. <laughs> so uh, the analog model was, um, was established that way. So pictures play an important, very often heuristic role in what we do. We build the common culture of pictorial representation in real space, even though a lot of the work we do is in rights and property spaces with holographers. And all of this is embedded in the chemical heuristics. So when we have connectivity, it affects other properties that we know from chemistry, such as oxidation states, vacancy, and electronegativity. And what I try to teach my, my, my uh, students often is that you could look at chemistry as a network where you just have atoms that are connected. And then you can almost do Kirchhoff type laws where bondings come in, bonds come in, and if you add bonding contributions, you end up with certain properties like oxidation states in atoms without even having to worry about charge. But it is very um, vital to develop this iconoclastic counterculture because there is this problem, in particular when you get measure of the self affirmation. <coughs> we want to see things. We want to see order. We don't want to see disorder. And a computer looks at things radically different than we do. If you would give a computer the task of figuring out what's the structure here, it would be one of these uh, things that computer scientists might refer to as confirming more of X, uh, a paradox that it's almost an impossible task to do. You, as you slowly start staring at this, if you don't know this, will sooner or later see that there is a structure in there. And those that come from former Soviet and East Bloc countries might have in their memory certain bits turned on that will allow them to see uh, what's going on here, what's in there. And uh, it's, a face. it's a face, yes. And uh, those skilled in the art and who had to deal with this know that this is actually Vladimir Ilyich Ulyanov, better known as Lady, that is in there. And, and now that I've given you the bias, the more you look at this, the more you see it in there. And that's how we work in imaging, right? That's, that's how humans see and how humans have developed. So here is his, his beard, here is his hand, here is his nose, here is his eyes, his particular forehead. And we, we suddenly see that now, right? And that's because we operate with a wide range of imagery. Also, when we do experiments, when we look into microscopes, and uh, because we organize things as visual concepts. And that's, that's very important to keep in the back of the mind. This is also classically known as the uh, rabbit duck problem. And once you have this, you can actually not un unsee these objects anymore the way you've seen it before. When you switch back and forth between seeing this as a rabbit and this as the ear, or uh, 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 seeing this as a duck, right? Uh, here's the one for mathematicians where we have an orthogonal uh, uh, basis set where you can see we're going more towards rabbit here. Or stuck here. So, um, but these these gestalt switches that you have between these things are very very important. And we look when we look at structure, it's always there as a bias. And we have to be very very aware about that. The other problem that we then have is we want to see things, and if, because we want to see things, and we're dealing with fuzzy and noisy structures, and we have intuition and a memory bank, that's a huge problem. And that's why I make this argument that I would like to supplement the human intervention in microscopy and imaging with one that does imaging completely different, and that would be an autonomous computer system, and then have a hybrid conversation of what is it actually that we see. Because there will be different biases. You can say, in a certain way, learning is a bias. And when a computer learns, and when there is deep learning, it is, it is a bias. But it's going to be a very different bias from our bias. And so uh, I think that's 
very, very interesting because there are misconceptions, right? We are witnessing a replication science uh, crisis in, 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 in many sciences, and a lot of it, in particular, sort of biological and medical sciences, are actually related to two things, bad imaging and faulty statistics. Because people have this sort of um, understanding that there are structures, you can define structures or correlations as the same thing. They're overstated in particular when you don't have sufficient sample sizes. And that's one of the things that you have in biological and medical sciences all the time. And so people then say, ah, oh, if we achieve statistical significance when we have measurement noise, when we just measure more and reduce the noise, we will get a better signal. That is not always true. I know that physicists refer to this as beating the square root out of the problem because we're constantly fighting the square root of signal over noise, but it doesn't always work. And uh, it doesn't work because there can be a high number of degrees of freedom, and we can have that in very complex structures, where you can create temporary statistical significance. And uh, you can also see that in noisy statistical settings, you get a very weak evidence of what your sign and your magnitude is, and it totally biases what you have, and uh, the estimates are much higher. This is not just theory. This is something that uh, um, Ron said you have 14 parameters and you can fit everything, right? I think an elephant is pretty much, I can define an elephant by 14 parameters. So if I look at this cross section, we can fit a beautiful elephant here, right? Not a problem. And then because I know it's an elephant, I can actually go further and say, well, I know how this cross section will continue. Here's my prediction for this cross section. That would be a classic imaging bias or model bias that I put in there. This is called theory latent experiments in, in, in the philosophy of science and actually with too many parameters for fitting elephants. That's, that's a problem. You have to find a way around it. There was actually recently an amazing event that is still being worked up by philosophers of science, psychologists, and whatnot. Because in December 2015, there were two independent experiments at the Large Hadron Collider, one of them called CMS and the other one ATLAS which pointed to evidence of new physics at a certain energy. And um, that was a 2.5 sigma statistic. And everybody said, well, let's just beat the crap out of it and measure for another, another, another six, nine months, a year, before we announce that we have new physics. The theoreticians didn't wait. There was on the web servers, on, on archive, 600 papers were brought in within a few weeks which all explain this in <coughs> physics. And at five sigma, which is the gold standard for uh, these kinds of discoveries, the structure of the correlation had disappeared. And the amazing thing about this was that it happened independently at two, two experiments at the same time. And so there's a lot of uh, things that are being still worked up by people who have now looked at the data, or talking with people, and uh, but this shows you, just because you have a signal somewhere in noisy data, be very, very careful. And uh, so, similar effects are in imaging. <coughs> the classic example that you might have seen, which does that, has nothing to do with uh, microscopy, but our brain is desperately always looking for structures, always. We want to see structures. We want to hang ourselves onto structure. So 1976, Viking flew by Mars. Of course, this is a face. Everybody sees this is a nose, this is a mouth, here are the eyes. So there, was there an ancient culture? It's all bullshit, of course, because as soon as you go and have higher resolution, the structure disappears. So it's an equivalent example that when you get better resolution, this perceived structure disappears. But we desperately want to hold on to this perceived structure for psychological reasons. So this is this is just to make this bias uh, um, uh, clear. And we're dealing with that in microscopy. So again, what I'm advocating is we have evolved in microscopy since uh, the light microscope. We have now here a happy man who has a very good understanding of electron optics. We have done aberration correction. You'll find out in a second what that means. We have much better electronics aberration correction. Not 
possible without better electronics. And better electronics also means stable beams, much better detectors. The detectors we have now are just absolutely amazing. They're quantum detectors. I mean, the efficiency is marvelous. So a happy man, but as I hope I've convinced you there, we need to get sort of to this hybrid, autonomous, and uh, reliable system here and then have a conversation between the tacit knowledge of the microscopist and what the machine learning or whatever you want to call us call it uh, gives us. So what do we do? So the happy microscopist with the uh, uh, tacit knowledge and uh, my partner in crime in all these endeavors is Doug Bloom. He came to us from Oak Ridge National Laboratory. And um, he runs this beast here, which uh, every dean will remind you how many English professors you could actually get for just the maintenance contracts, plus the shielding, plus whatnot, you know, and why do we really need this, Tom? Uh, I'm proud to announce that since 15 years, this machine is running in the basement and it's producing data, and we have uh, done, I think, pretty decent work uh, on this microscope. And the, why we have to go through this pain of shielding is here. This little beast here costs a million dollars, and it takes a guy like Doug to understand how it really works. Because one of the biggest problems is aberration correction. But before we get to that, what do we do with this machine? Just so you get an idea, we have a sample. We scan with a probe that's a nanometer size or less, 0.1 nanometers, we can get it down if we want to. We scatter along here, and then we get scattering below the sample. This scattering then is either collected in a high angle annular detector, that's where a horrible abbreviation, H-A-A-D-F comes from, high angular, annular, uh, the, 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 uh, high angular, annular, dark field imaging. And if you go to the low field, you go to another detector down there, you can actually do spectroscopy. So you can do imaging. These are data, data from Nigel Browning. This is his famous um, defect structure where you can see that there's something at the periodicity that is that, 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 that doesn't work here. Um, the contrast that you see in these dots is directly proportional to the atomic number in this type of measurement, not in all. And that'll become important in a, in a few slides. And you can now go and do measurements here and here and see if you get any changes in the electronic structure to understand what this defect is. So this becomes quite involved, quite complex. But to get to these pictures is not that um, easy because you have to shield. So this is an aluminum box. This is an aluminum box that we need because we need to make sure that there are no electromagnetic field perturbations that come in. A truck moving a few hundred meters away from this microscope is a piece of metal that is displacing Earth's magnetic field, and that means we get electromagnetic perturbations where we can't measure. Uh, they had to rewire the library with uh, three-phase current. They didn't do uh, the three-phase current as correct as they should. We got radio frequency interferences. Uh, this here are accelerometers. If you go like this next to the microscope, you will see it's it, it, can't image temperature changes, temperature drift. It's it's a real battle to make sure what you have. And so it's very, <laughs> very rare that you see Doug smiling like that because normally he's always fighting a battle. This is in the uh, clean new um, shielding box that we built. And the question is also what do we do with noise? And we have taken the approach that we do not subtract noise on the basis of that we don't understand noise, but we always live with noise in data because we think it's an integral part of the signal and maybe we will come to a better understanding of what this noise is all about. One of the problems that you have to get to these pictures is because there are aberration corrections that are needed in the electron microscope. And one of the things you can see here is this is called spherical aberration. It basically means in electrons, your lenses are electromagnetic um, devices. They are horrible compared to 
lenses that you can do with optics. With optics, you get aberration too. You get positive aberration, so you get this disc moving like this. You can move it backwards and forwards, and you can just stack them on top of each other, and you will correct for aberration for any lens problems that you have. Um, in electromagnetic lenses, this is really, really tough. It took a while. You can also, I won't, you can, you can also have uh, a not well-defined energy, which leads to chromatic aberration, and the diffraction limit, which depends on the energy. Uh, goes down, but you see you come to a certain point of illumination angle that you have to increase because you want signal and you need spherical aberration uh, correction here. So um, this took a, a long time, about 50 years to get done. What you see here is the resolution in electron imaging, starting with the light microscope. Abe here, then the light microscope pretty much reached its saturation level. Then people started working on electron microscope, Hans Puska, uh, with 75 kilovolts, and people increased the voltage. You can see in Stuttgart they had a system of 1.2 megavolts. The problem was you didn't have samples that would survive that strong of an energy. So uh, sooner or later there was an issue here that you couldn't get into a better resolution. And then aberration correction came in. These are the three musketeers who uh, did the aberration correction. Uh, this is Maximilian Heider, who runs the company who builds the corrector. This is, in the world, the guy who understands electron optics better than anybody else, Harald Rosen. And this is Knut Goban, who was uh, director at Jülich and became very instrumental that this actually happened due to the fact that he played tennis with the right people. Sometimes that's the way science progresses. So, but before we get there, Scherzer theory says if you will have spherical aberration. One of the early uh, conditions for this and understanding is that if you have a static and rotationally symmetric electromagnetic field, you will always end up with aberration corrections. He thought about it, he wrote this paper, why it occurs in 1936. He thought about it for 11 years and said, one of the things we can do is we can deviate slightly from spherical uh, symmetry of our electromagnetic field, and we can do that with multipoles. So we can approximate the circle with multipoles, and once you do that, it actually works quite well. And this is what happens. It, it, you, you, you can't really see it here, but this is a simulation of how slightly you distort this symmetry away from, from a circle and introduce a, a symmetry so that you can compensate for um, the electromagnetic uh, positive spherical aberration before and afterwards. So this is this is really, it was an art, it took a long time, and I just want to point out a few things. So 47, Schelzer and Munich said, we can correct for this stuff. Seliger was the first guy who built one in Tübingen, and it was absolutely instable. There's nothing you could do with this thing, but the important step was that he proved that you have a negative spherical aberration, which means, in principle, you could correct for the positive spherical aberration that occurs in these electromagnetic uh, lenses. Then you go on, people start playing around with quadrupole, quadrupole, it takes way too long time. 1980, Hanel advises the National Science Foundation to no longer fund aberration correction projects. It's taken too long, too much money, you guys are never gonna get there, it's ridiculous, stop. Right? So this is the sort of Soviet approach of we know what's best and we need to use our money more efficiently this and that. Then they kept working quietly and did various, it's a fascinating story. Haida actually convinced the European Molecular Biology Laboratory to do a little setup because he said it's going to become important for biology. He always says he didn't know it, but it actually happened because cryo electron microscopy is profiting from this advance. And Knut Oban played tennis with the right people and could convince the Volkswagen Stiftung to throw a little bit of money into this project. And that survived. And uh, Heido proved on an electro-optical bench that it worked at Bernd Carbius in Jülich um, in 1997, made the first corrected images. And so it took a long time, and uh, sometimes we, you know, when these people say 50 years, when people say uh, we're doing transformative work, uh, what have you done the last six months? 
friendship. It's not how science works. You need that time to think, to make mistakes, and uh, this is this is this is really a problem. So, what do we need this microscope for? Um, we have structures, and I'm going <coughs> to jump right into the structure. This is a structure that we have that is highly complex, highly complex. What you see here are octahedra. This is a box of about 20 by 20 angstrom, and it's only one of uh, four angstroms, or yeah, four angstroms thick. That means we can put exactly one octahedra in there. It's an ideal uh, E. coli for all our work. You can see that you have corner sharing, you have edge sharing. This took Pete DeSantos about three and a half, four years to figure out with standard crystallographic techniques how to actually um, make uh, get to this structure. And um, the final result was fitting 200 adjustable parameters in a least square fit, with, even though dampening the off diagonal elements and all this stuff, it was still a least square fit. And it was a huge problem uh, to get this accepted by the science, the science community. Because, okay, here we are. Not every fit is a good fit. <laughs> so these are the, these one-dimensional representations of crystallography. They're one dimensions, so they're not unique. We have a lot of constrained, constrained parameter space because parameter space is so big. We have to say this is a reasonable metal oxygen distance. If you move beyond that, forget about it. We're not even going there. We're jumping back into a region where it's reasonable. So this is constrained refinement, constrained refinement. There's a lot of tacit knowledge that goes in there, a lot of chemistry. And then ADPs are garbage bags, which means the displacement of atoms, which become really important, are garbage bags for any kind of systematic errors that you have with respect to absorption corrections and other things. Just to quickly show you, any, you, and you, can, you look at these two projections of structures, we immediately say they're different, right? This looks like it's so a little bit denser here. It looks like a little bit more water here on that side. They're different. We can look at that real quick. If you do a one-dimensional representation, which the physicists would call a correlation function, and you, you, you take a model of A and B and, and, and put them together, the only deviation you can hang your hat on is that little red and blue difference right there. And this is radically different if we look at it just purely from observation. So this is a first order correlation function that you can derive of this. So that's the inherent problem that you have with one dimensional representation. The microscopy at that time, this was, microscopists now divide time into BC and AC, before correction and after correction. So this is before correction. You see it's all fuzzy. You can lay your structure in there. And if you want to believe it, you can believe it. We refer to this phase as imaging and imagining, two different things, but we did a lot of that. And now you go to an aberration corrective microscope. This is what you will see. The resolution, the stability. And now what you can do is very simply just scan along this direction. You get a scan here. Because it is proportional to the atomic number, the thing you can do is say, OK, here I have more vanadium. Vanadium is higher in the periodic table. The signal has to be lower. Here I have less vanadium, and the lithium has, has a higher Z, so these two will have to be higher. <coughs> and you can validate your structure beautifully. You can figure out all the details that we did. And if you compare what we get out of a microscope in a morning's work compared to a couple of years' work in uh, the diffraction techniques, this is it. So now. I want to quickly um, get into this aspect of the calculations. How much time do I actually have? Take your time. So. OK. So without going too much into detail, this high angle annular detector that I showed you, um, there's very little diffraction that occurs here. It's pretty much incoherent scattering. Physicists also call that Rutherford scattering. And it only depends on how many electrons you actually have in this atom. That's why, it's, why it is proportional to the atomic number squared, roughly. There is channeling along atomic columns. 
So what that means is if you go down columns, the electron will have more interaction with the nucleus, with the, with the potential of the nucleus, and will get pulled away from the area between the columns that you have. It's called electron channel. For that alone, you have to do simulations. So what is that? So, so our um, approach has been to always do frozen phonon simulations. So what are frozen phonon simulations? The electrons that we use for um, probing are 200 kilometers. That's about half the speed of light. If you look at what the vibration of an atom is, it's about 10 to the minus 5 the speed of light. So for our observation time, this thing is frozen, even though it's constantly vibrating. And that's why it's called frozen phonon uh, simulation. So what we do is we take this specimen, we divide it up into these slices. That's why this is called the multi-slice method, which was developed originally by Cooley and Moody. And then you add these slices on top of it. You take the wave function, and you have it interact with your atomic potential of your atoms. And then you just transfer from one slice to the next. It's an ideal parallel computing problem. So basically, the image intensity uh, can, is a convolution of the specimen transmission function and the channeling probe here, where you have a certain thickness and also the various vectors that uh, determine where your atoms are. It's a pretty straightforward brute approach, which means before the days of uh, um, GPUs, don't buy this power. I mean, it's a sequential. Yes. OK. I'm showing you here when I go through here. I went too fast. It's one electron. Now I have the next electron. Ah, now I have those electrons. And these electrons do not couple or correlate with each other. So what I, I don't do is an experiment with one electron. I shoot 10 to the whatever at it. I try to minimize it from the mean dimension. So these electrons, there's, there's no interaction between them. That's why I can just add it up. And that's why it's a beautiful parallel problem. And then when you actually go, you can see what happens when you use GPUs coming out of the gaming industry. You save from easily factor 10 or more uh, in, in, in computation time. And if you get somebody who really understands GPUs, like people at Berkeley do, who really get your code, your do loop, nesting, and everything straight, you can win enormous amounts of time and suddenly tackle problems that before people would say, you're out of your mind. You are absolutely out of your mind trying. OK, so, so since you're powered in all these electrons, what is this computation bottleneck? Is the sequential part of you go the specimen? Or, what? or is it just the deal? It's a done deal. The, the computationally, the most important, the, the most uh, uh, taxing um, part is I/O. How much memory can I get on the chip so that I can actually do the calculation without it's having to do I/O? It's hardware related, or really, really having a computer scientist understand CUDA better than. And, and these models, these ingredients like that, that kernel, this is all good. It's nice, accepted. I'll get to that in a second. There, there's, there, there's one issue that we've uncovered now uh, that came up in Mexico at the conference that we're, 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 we now understand a lot more what's happening. So, OK, so again, um, computing helped a lot. And we had sort of an, a question when we look at these atom columns. And the question was, we have so many per uh, uh, permutations that we can get down there. Um, what happens if we get, which for lack of a better word, we call isophilic uh, configurations? What does isophilic mean? This means if I have two different atomic species here, they tend to cluster together. So it, it's, they segregate. So the vanadium like to have vanadium as a neighbor, the molybdenum like to have molybdenum as a neighbor. Do these give the same signal? Now, to make a long story short, they don't because we are no longer doing kinematic diffraction theory. We're doing dynamical fraction theory, and you can actually uh, see here that this deviation here is due to so-called penny rules and fractions. So this um, is an old slide, and uh, we had written on this more on this soon. So now comes the more on this. So if you look at this structure, 
that we have this 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 catalyst or whatever it is. We have atomic columns going down perpendicular to what you see. So you can see that in this case, the niobiums are indicated as green. They're fully occupied. It's just niobium, niobium, niobium down the column. Now here in the case of uh, molybdenum is blue and vanadium is red. This here means that it's about a third vanadium, two thirds vanadium. So I have an average composition down such an atomic column as uh, um, that exists. Now, kinematic diffraction theory, the what we normally do crystallography with, uses what's called a virtual crystal approximation. So you can calculate the intensity of your reflection and what comes in is the structure factor squared. The structure factor squared is basically a convolution of two things. You have a scattering factor here. This scattering factor here is multiplied by an exponential where you have the so-called Miller indices which define the Bragg planes from which you diffract. And in these Bragg planes where you diffract, you have atoms with coordinates. So this will give you a structure factor. You scare your structure, uh, square your structure factor, and then you put all these corrections and other things in and you get your intensity. So what you do is when you have a third of vanadium and two thirds of molybdenum, you take a structure factor and you make a virtual structure factor that you do out of the average of one third to two thirds. That's kinematic diffraction. And the other thing that comes in here is that this um, structure factor, in particular with x-rays, but also with electrons and not with neutrons, I won't go into that, also depends on a, another convolution with an exponential. This here is a displacement parameter. You see how the structure factor falls off depending on what this displacement factor is. So you scatter less when you have more vibration at higher angle. That's, that's just it. So now, let's go back to um, this column. Interesting. So let's take this site, S1 here. S1 is I have 30% vanadium in there, in this column. If you want to look at how, and, and, and let's say I only do 30 um, boxes, 30 elements, uh, unit cells down. I have now about uh, 1.4 million combinations because it's 30 faculty divided by nine faculty. That's 21 faculty, uh, different ways to arrange this. So I have 1.4 million different perturbations. And everybody said, oh, you're never going to figure out what that looks like, because the contrast that you have when you just switch one atom for another, you have a new configuration, you're never going to figure out what you have. But if you now look at if you can figure out when you have what I introduced as these isophilic configurations, because we had indications that there, are, there is a contrast that is slightly different, can you actually find something out? So what do I mean with that? So we take 13 columns down here. This column here is niobium, that's gold. Um, the um, tellurium is white. If you don't have anything in there, it's black. And here, these yellow and greens are now these molybdenum, vanadium, uh, 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 atomic columns. And you're imaging down this way. Put in a random number generator, but you make sure that you always in the column have the appropriate composition. And so then you get end up with these seven different um, configurations. Now, the signal also depends on uh, not just the stacking order, but also how many boxes you uh, stack on top of each other. And if you do that, you end up with a signal that's shown here. So you see that there is quite some dispersion that you have. You don't just get one signal. This is no longer kinematic scattering. This is each vanadium and each molybdenum atom has its own interaction potential. And the question becomes, do we displace them coherently <coughs> or incoherently? That's, that's where the issues come in. But, so this is, this is normalized to a full molybdenum column 
As you put vanadium in, vanadium is lighter, has a higher Z, the signal will go down. This red line is the best fit. If you now compare this dispersion of calculating explicit cation ordering, and that takes a long time. Every configuration is about a CPU year, if you would translate that. So we did a lot in Texas at the uh, XC, and we ran the clusters hot here because nobody was doing any genetic stuff anymore. So we got a lot of feedback. If you take the virtual crystal approximation, where you just take an average scattering factor, mm -hmm. this is what you see, what you get. Which is generally done. Which is generally done. Because nobody's as crazy as us to calculate all these things and see what actually happened. If you take the explicit cation ordering, so now you go to a signal of, let's say, 0.6 normalized to molybdenum. Here, according to the VCA, you would now run to your friend, the catalyst guy, and say, yeah, you got about, just about almost 0.3 vanadium in there. Here, you got double, 0.6 vanadium in there. So that's an error of 100%. Not something that we like. So the question really is, um, how can we tackle this? Because 1.4 million configurations, we can't, we can't calculate this. So we went back and said, but we have indications from other experiments that we have this isophilic or, or, or uh, this segregation, these isophilic uh, chains. So what happens there? So here now you have models of what we call isophilic configurations. So you see here on top is vanadium. You fill each, channel, each atomic column up with vanadium, and underneath is molybdenum, right? Here we've done exactly the opposite. We fill everything up with moly on the top, then we have vanadium down there. Then we separate them, so we have in this case vanadium up here, a bit of moly in here, so you would say the surface here is enriched with vanadium, and here the surface is enriched with moly. So you get these different configurations. And again, you're respecting the configuration in each of these atomic columns to have the same composition. And then you image from the top, and you look at what you get. And if you do that, you can see, let's just look at the, at, at the cases where you have vanadium at the top, molybdenum in the middle, molybdenum at the top, and vanadium in the middle. So you can see that in particular here, there are large differences. If you look at the signal, it's 20%. We should be able to measure that. Here you don't see a difference because that's niobium. We still calculated that in there because this arrow tells us how good our simulations are. Because there should, in principle, not be a difference here. And the more molybdenum you have, the smaller the effect is. But so you can get a distinct signal depending on the ordering of your atoms in an atomic column if you um, look at very specific isophilic um, configurations. So, um, and you can actually go on. But, uh, yes? These, these, these configurations sort of deviate extremely from what the typical averaging aspect does, right? But there are also zones of those that deviate. Yes. Yes. So what is the conclusion? The conclusion is that if you get less random, more isophilic configurations, I can I can tell you if you, you should have a vanadium rich or a molybdenum rich surface. Yeah, but how from the experimental, from the data acquisition, can you distinguish this? So what you do is you you look at the relative difference between these isophilic configurations that you have here, and you can see that the relative difference can be up to 20% of the signal. And then you can do the same thing, actually, and compare with your experimental data, where you also see differences. Then we're all, to match the... We don't try to match it here. We're just comparing. And this is this is this is what with this relative standard deviation, which is a coefficient of variation, you can see that it trends very similar to what has been done over here with experimental value. What is the difference in the signal? Noise. So 
In other words, you are matching your fluctuations in, in your measurements with extremal configurations that deviate from your average. Yes. That, that's what you do. Yes. And I cannot. You have a second order kind of approach from the first order, zero order average. <clears throat> Well, because I'm not doing kinematic diffraction, and because I know that the ordering matters in dynamical scattering, the idea was that we should get a different signal. Now, if I have an isophilic configuration, and I switch one or two atoms, I will not have enough signal to distinguish. In other words, these your response to many of those formerly different isophilic stuff will be almost the same. Exactly. It's only that you have longer strings of neighbors. Yes, that's, that's why we actually... But then you would have to quantify in order to get it. Yes, so we're... But this this was after long, after probably two years of, of, of calculation, the first time that we've shown that when you take what we call very distinct extreme cases, this is you know, the, the original term we had was less random. Yeah. They didn't like that. That's why we sort of said, okay, it's the atoms tend to uh, to uh, to cluster with like-minded atoms, easel. Yeah. This gives you, in some cases, 20% different scattering intensity, which is enough to measure. And so, you know, uh, if you look at the numbers that I showed before with the permutation, maybe one day somebody will do a quantum computing experiment on that, but. Uh, with standard practices, you won't you won't get anywhere. So where is this going? I'll stop in a second. Where is this going? What what is the problem? The problem that we now have is, if you do simulations, we've done this now. Um, it's the displacement parameters that are the big problem. So what you can see if you do an independent displacement, this here gets much weaker. Whereas if you lock them which means you're forcing them to deviate from the, uh, the, the same way, you get a much stronger signal. And how that is calculated different in the various codes, even Collins code doesn't do it the right way. So that we're having discussions there on how, how to do a better approximation. And then again, the deviation of displacement is, is, is modeled isotropic cases should probably be anisotropic and so on and so on. <coughs> so um, I think I'll I'll stop here and um, I, I, I had a little piece but maybe that's for a sidebar uh, because I was a little bit intrigued by Ron's statements about deep learning and the hype that's going on and it's actually true if you go through the crystallography databases everywhere you have now these papers that you know with titles like a cnn based screening and uh, you know you it's 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 being done but it's probably not being done in the way as it should be done and there is definitely an opportunity for mathematics to um <laughs> contribute and <laughs> thank you peter <laughs> Questions? Oh, just a naive one. Regarding what you just said about this uh, DNNs on, on your sheet, do, do you think uh, there are uh, significant advances being done thanks to this uh, method? Which method? The, 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 the latter one? The, yeah, the convolutional the neural nets. So the, it is driven largely by the fact that we have created a data avalanche that we can no longer deal with with postdocs or students. If you go to a free electron laser or a modern synchrotron, you're creating so much data that nobody will ever look at again. So the idea is to have an interface there where you can, so one, 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 one of these, these, this first one here, they are actually just looking at, at screening for serial um, uh, crystallography. The experiment is brutally simple. You have a beam, 
you have dust, pixie dust, your material, you, you, you run it through the beam, and at 100 kilohertz, you're getting images coming out. How are you going to figure out what you have there? So you need to have screening for um, rag reflections and things like that. Other approaches are, so this is driven by the data avalanche that you're creating. Yeah, but so my question was more directed towards the outcome, not the way it works, but... What is your impression? Is this really bringing <clears throat> new yeah. uh, results? I'd be more pragmatist and say, it brings me results. If they are new, I have to figure out later. But I cannot find out if these are new and interesting results in the original approach, where I have to say to, to, to 50 postdocs now go through the data and tell me what we've actually seen here. That's just, so you, you can, you're doing so much more experiments in ultra fast reactions where you have to figure out what happens to the structure. People are looking at explosions now, for example, with three electron lasers. Or we've done an experiment recently where we put a titanium sapphire laser on a foil and we're just watching how it vibrates and what happens to the structure. Mm -hmm. We have to measure, we could measure, as far as we could go, at 100 picoseconds. Okay. So the amount of data you're creating there is a challenge to be, first of all, the first challenge is for the electronics guy to get the data out of the detector, because mm -hmm. that can be limiting your pipeline there. And then how do you analyze this stuff? I mean, you're creating gigabytes of stuff within, within seconds, or less than a second. So it, it, it becomes a tool to actually look at the data. What's in there could be very interesting. In our case, for example, there was something new in there. Nobody had noticed, because if you, if you take a structure and you dynamically displace it with a, with a titanium sapphire laser, you just put a shock wave into it, the structure goes like this, and you can actually achieve regions of negative pressure mm -hmm. because you're expanding. People had always claimed that that should be possible, but now if you would put, for example, so the next experiment would be, Let's put a gas around it and see that now, because we're getting negative uh, expansion and the structure expands, that we can put something in it that before we couldn't put in. Things like that. So, There's, maybe she's wondering, but the machine learning tool has been a long time. Mm -hmm. And you could also process huge, huge data. And for instance, these networks come with some other challenges. If you have <coughs> a huge amount of data, you, your objective function also becomes huge. Yes. I mean, it's not that this is all of a sudden a, a, a silver bullet that gives you an answer for free. No, it's not what a silver bullet. She's probably wondering what is the difference between those methods and, and say, other, uh, other attempts to classify them. Yes, exactly. So, so what have you been brought to the, the back of the law? Why is, is this conceived as a, a perceived as an enabling uh, methodology? Because nobody really knows whether they, they can train their networks. Uh, so very often when you have fast things that you want to observe, in particular like chemical reactions, the first approach is a classification problem. We're not looking we're not looking for cats and dogs. We're looking for different structures. And so that is one of the approaches that actually was done which has really been helpful. Mm -hmm. So that- uh, uh, They have been classified before. I mean, clustering techniques before. Yes, so but what, what, makes, what is the difference? The speed. Yeah, that would be, because all you will do is if you believe that this is a wonderful thing. I, 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 I don't believe that it's a wonderful thing. I, don't, I cannot judge if this thing uh, uh, is based on sound mathematics or not. All I can say is, that I have a data avalanche and people will look for all sorts of tools. And uh, it is very appealing that you have a device that, whatever that connotation again means, can be trained to recognize things and learn because people will do experiments over and over again. Again, these are not the first classifiers. I will. Um, I mean, it's the, and the automation of the process. Uh, yes, the automation. The automation of the process that you can just throw the data to the machine. You could do that before. I mean, clustering games there, or you could or you automatize it. Why not? Random forest. I don't know. I don't know the other. Well, 
Why, why didn't people jump on those ones? Part of it could be the hype. I think this is fine. Part of it could be the hype, and uh, part of it uh, also is uh, that there is a hope that there is a magic bullet or, or, a, or a silver hammer to, to help you. And, but, the, but the one thing that is true is that you have an enormous amount of data that you have to deal with. And you have to deal with it smart in the sense that you have to see what do I want to look into further? And what do I just say, oh, this is nonsense, I'm not gonna, gonna look at that. So it's the same problem like figuring out what's junk DNA and what's the DNA I want to look at. So you wanna have some qualifier that allows you to, you, you cannot look at every individual event or piece of data there that, that, that that you're collecting, you know, and, you're, and that's becoming more and more of a problem, especially the free electron lasers. The time structures there now are, you know, as I said, the first problem was how do I get the data out of the, out of the, mm -hmm. out of the detector? Mm -hmm. And so, yeah, I, I think. But, but in, in your last uh, problem, it seems to be now a clear uh, thing. You collect extreme configuration. Yes. You design that. Yes. You, you make that. You think this this gives me differences in my output. Mm -hmm. You you that is your feature. Yes. Sir. And now you start training on training on on, 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 on your measurement data and, 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 and the relation to these features. Create a, and then try to a dictionary or a database. Yeah. Yeah. Which is oh, right. specifically for that system, yeah. right? Specifically for that system, because it takes you quite some time to get building up the dictionary is the hardest thing. Mm 